All right, so without further ado, uh, Patrick Byrne, he is the president of and CEO of um, Overstock.com. I'm sorry, chairman and CEO of Overstock.com. And he's also the man uh, who has put together DeepCapture.com. Uh, Patrick, welcome back to the Young Turks. Great to be back on. Thanks. All right, now, Patrick, I, I know you uh, care very much about the uh, financial industry and how they've basically taken over the government, which I agree with you on. Uh, now, Barack Obama is going to uh, push for new regulatory reform that could hopefully help with that process. Uh, what do you think about his proposals? <clears throat> what do I think? Well, uh, I think it's directionally correct, as they would say on Wall Street. We need to be looking at this. I kind of wish it were the first thing he looked at. I, don't, I think the whole argument about more regulation versus le less, le less regulation is, is generally misguided. The issue is our regulators have gotten captured. We do need to reform regulation. The whole regulation, we need to take a fresh look at it. But the main event, which I'm sorry to say our president isn't talking about, is the regulatory capture. The regulators have come under the thumb of Wall Street, and that's, I don't really, there's nothing in his speech yesterday that's, or anything he's done so far that really says he's willing to take that on in a deep way. Well, let's talk about that for a quick second. Now, the other day there was a judge, I believe in New York, who said that the uh, deal between the Bank of America and the SEC, who was supposed to regulate them, uh, he would not accept that settlement, that they had reached a settlement uh, because Bank of America had misled their shareholders about what kind of bonuses they were going to give the Merrill Lynch executives who were taken over, right? Right. It was a and, deal. And and uh, the judge said, no, uh, we're, we're, I don't accept this. It's not a good enough deal. Now, what do you think might be a motivation of the SEC to cut Bank of America such a good deal? Well, it's a sweetheart deal. It's been very clearly established for three or four years and made public by things like the Madoff case, where it turns out that the, the SEC was warned and warned and warned and just gave Bernie Madoff a hall pass. It's very clear that the the brass within the SEC are... They can leave the SEC and go get jobs, literally making, in some cases, $2 million a year. They can, and they have their eyes fixed on those jobs, and you don't get those jobs if you actually regulate. So there is now the, the rank and file, from my experience, of the SEC are honorable people, are good government people going to work on to do their job. But having been probed, having been in this fight for four or five years now with the SEC, I'm pretty confident, I'm totally confident, that the upper tier of the SEC has been captured, and they're not willing to stand up to the oligarchs. They're not willing to stand up to powerful Wall Street players. Because if you rock the boat, the chance of you getting uh, a nice deal once you leave the SEC from Bank of America or Citigroup, et cetera, is not going to be very high. You know, you go along to get along, right? Oh, absolutely. Now, and this isn't just some Hollywood theory. This is now completely documented. We document it within Deep Capture. It's been made clear because of the the Madoff case, and also some other aspects of the crisis, which were totally preventable, t brought to the SEC's attention, and they just stalled and wouldn't close loopholes because their friends on Wall Street were making too much money. Well, besides which, it's logical, because uh, if you think you're going to get a big payoff, you think you're going to piss off the guys who are going to pay you all that money? No, not very likely. So now, the problem is, how do you fix that? Because that's a, that's a really big systemic problem, Patrick, so how do we address it? Well, one thing would, would and you know, that's a great question, and there's a sort of philosophical point that I'll get to in a second, but the, the, you, we've got to, uh, I think, end the revolving door, do something like they've done in the military, not that it's completely effective or like they've done in Congress, but when you leave government, empl empl uh, when you leave the SEC, it should be at least two, maybe four years before you can go to work for one of these law firms. Uh, and, you know, just six months ago, the head of enforcement, Linda Thompson, left the SEC and went to Davis Polk, the, where she's defending, Davis Polk is defending the people that she was bringing enforcement, that the enforcement division was looking at. So it's just incredibly incestuous. Yeah, you know, let, before we go on, let me give you two quick emails. Uh, now that people are investigating, so Andrew Cuomo investigating in New York for Bank of America specifically, but there's a lot of investigations going on. Uh, we found some emails, and now this is not uh, completely analogous because it's not the SEC, but there's an exchange between two employees at the S&P. Uh, official number one says in an email, by the way, that deal is ridiculous. Official number two says, I know, right? Model definitely does not capture half the risk. Official number one, we should not be rating it. Official number two, we rate every deal. It could be structured by cows, and we would rate it. 
Okay, now in a second email in 2006, another S&P employee, this was found by congressional investigators, said, quote, let's hope we're all wealthy and retired by the time this house of cards falters. So, Patrick, it appears that they were completely aware uh, oh, yeah. that, of what they were doing here. They knew that they had built up a house of cards. But that leads us to the regulation question. Uh, I think the regulation does make an enormous difference. For example, on leverage. If you say, hey, you can leverage your dollar up to $30, well, then obviously it's going to allow for a hell of a lot more risk than if you say, as we had uh, pre-19, uh, I'm sorry, pre-2004, you could leverage the dollar only up to 12 extra dollars. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I don't mean to be flippant about the regulation. Good regulation is important, and we should be reforming our regulation. There's lots of things that need to be done. Certainly things that certainly leverage. And the problem is I believe there's still more leverage in the system than people understand. There's still derivative risk scattered through the system that hasn't been made apparent. And so you need good regulation, but when you've got regulators who are on such chums with the people they're supposed to be overseeing that they're giving them hall passes, which absolutely happened here, that's, you know, it doesn't really matter what rules you change on the books. But I agree, especially with leverage, they, they, and derivatives, they should be looking into making transparent. The model that says, uh, you know, just let, just allow people's private interest to self-regulate. So before I do business with J.P. Morgan, I'm Citibank, and I'm going to look at their balance sheet and stuff. That doesn't work. It's like Warren Buffett has said, it's a little bit like venereal disease. It's not important. It's not it's important not only that you know who you're sleeping with, but you've got to know everyone she's sleeping with. And that's basically impossible when you're talking about these kinds of uh, opaque financial risks. So well, more you, transparency and less leverage. Well, you know, Alan Greenspan basically admitted it in Congress after the economic collapse. Uh, when Henry Waxman asked him about it, he said, yes, my whole way of looking at this, my ideological stance on this, that it, the market would self-regulate, turned out to be incorrect. Uh, and so that, that's a fairly large admission by, by Greenspan. And, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but that was definitely the heart of what he said. Now, but so He said his models didn't account for this. That's right. But there's another aspect that it seems to me, you know, the, it seems to me that the left and the right are sort of still playing their old games with this. Yeah, there's that aspect. And when you're talking about financial risk, there's, there's A, this sort of transparency problem. B, financial industry by its nature draws fraudsters because the nature of every financial business is you give me money now and later if you break your windshield or your car or you have a health problem, I'll pay. So that's the, by nature it attracts fraudsters. It needs to be regulated. But there's another side to this that doesn't get so talked about as much, which is that I'd say more uncomfortable for the left that the subprime collapse was a, the subprime industry was a very regulated industry. The mortgage industry is very regulated. The federal government basically has been pushing the market, distorting the market for 70 years, and they pushed harder and harder and harder till it finally blew up. And then they say, well, you see, this shows we need more government. It's not as simple as that. Well, look, it's not a matter of we need, quote unquote, more regulation. It's a matter of what kind of regulation. So. If someone proposes regulation that doesn't make sense, you say, "Well, all right, that's not going to help the problem." But if they propose something that does make sense, for example, the you know, I mean, I can go all day with this naked CDSs, where yeah. it's just absolute gambling. Well, I don't know why we allow it at all. Now, you know, in my opinion, the Obama administration comes with weak sauce and says, "Please, please, please, pretty please, can we at least record these enormous, just basically bets, casino bets that you're making with one another?" And the banks tell them, "No." Uh, and that's because we already gave them the money. I mean, how, how stupid are we that uh, we asked them to take on new rules after we gave them the money? But that's because we're not stupid, Patrick. It's because the politicians are also in the pocket of the bankers. Absolutely. You know, there's, this actually extends. There's a Marxist tradition in law schools called the critical legal studies movement. And out of that has come this theory of what's called deep capture, that regulatory capture just doesn't occur with this or that regulator comes under some guy's thumb from Wall Street, but the capture extends all the way through the politicians, through maybe law enforcement, even into the university system and the journalists. I think the New York financial media has a lot to answer for, because a lot of things that happened were waved in front of their face. They did nothing about it, because they're such chums with the people that write. So the capture doesn't just stop with the regulators. You're correct. It goes through the political class. You know, just there, look at the donations. Wall Street is has uh, had gave in the, elect the last election cycle across across both parties. 
And, you know, look, it's easy to say across both parties. That's a safe way of saying it. But that brings us finally to the political issue. The reality is if you ask me, about half the Democratic Party is captured, uh, including uh, famously Larry Summers, who's now the number one advisor to Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton when they passed the deregulation in uh, 99 and 2000, which turned out to be disastrous. But 100% of the Republican Party is captured by the bankers. Whenever you propose any regulation, they say, no, don't worry, the bankers will figure it out on their own. Let's not bother them. Let's let the free market work itself out. Uh, isn't it incumbent upon us to point out where the culprits are? And, and in this case, I'd say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it looks to me that there are half of the Democrats who actually fight for their voters to some degree, and half of them are captured. And I don't see a single Republican that isn't captured. Uh, well, that hasn't been my experience. I've spent five years, and I've made it sort of my hobby. I've been back in D.C. for four or five years and had lawyers and economists and sort of funded this whole movement. Well, funded lobbyists and lawyers and economists going to senators, going to Congress, you know, members of the House of Representatives, explaining the systemic risk, trying to convince them to act. And I wouldn't say that it breaks so cleanly as you say. And my experience is more pessimistic than yours. I put it at about 15%. I think about 15% of the people I've, I meet in Washington, in Congress or in administration or regulatory circles, are uncaptured. I think about 85% listen to any issue, and they're just listening to how do they, how do they, how do they spin it, how do they play it, what's their angle. Now, there are certainly some egregiously captured guys, Congressman Baker, Con Senator Richard Shelby on the Republican side. I'd also have to say Chuck Schumer on the Democrat. But mm -hmm. I think that it's more like there's about 15% in the political class that aren't captured. The only, the only people who seem to care about the country, in my experience in D.C., are the, anybody I've come across from the DOJ or the DOD. The only people who aren't playing the political games. Everybody else is on the make in some way. Yeah, you know, I, I hear you on that. But I, you know, from time to time, you will see Democrats who fight the banks. Dick Durbin did a couple of months ago, and then he came out and said, "Hey, look, this, they still run this place. Uh, they couldn't win that fight, but he did fight them." You know, from time to time, Barney Frank, Alan Grayson, uh, yeah, I agree. Democrat Bar from Florida. I agree. Barney Frank, Barney Frank did everything to keep the uh, the subprime the subprime mess might have been stopped in 2005. He did everything he could to keep the, uh, the subprime mortgage industry from being reined in. Chris Dodd. Chris Dodd is totally... Uh, well, you know, we're going to have some disagreements there because that Barney Frank issue cuts a lot of different ways. Chris Dodd, yes, he took some uh, loans that he uh, clearly should not have taken. But now, and I agree with you, he was captured. But now in an effort to backpedal because he's in a lot of political trouble, he's one of the guys who seems to be fighting a little bit against the banks. And it's ironic. Don't get me wrong, Okay. But it's because he's in political trouble. And, uh, and on the Republican side, I should point out there is one guy who I don't think is captured, and it's Ron Paul. I, well, I, I, I'm a big Ron Paul supporter. I'd also say there's a guy in Iowa named Grassley, Charles Grassley. Wow, Grassley is so 50-50. <laughs> okay, I mean, on that health care stuff, he's, uh, in my opinion, terrible. And I don't mean that in terms of I don't agree with his health care proposals. I mean, he will sneak stuff into bills, giving away billions of dollars to the health care industry left and right. But well, from time to time, Grassley does do the right thing, and I point that out, I pointed that out like two days ago on the show. That's why he's kind of a maddening figure. I'd put him in there with Dodd as to when they do the right thing, when they don't. Who, it's anybody's guess. But, but look, final thing on this, Patrick, and we're talking to uh, Patrick Byrne, the CEO of uh, Overstock.com and also the guy who runs DeepCapture.com. Uh, we got to find a way out. <laughs> and so you're saying with the regulators, let's make sure they don't get jobs in the same industry that they're regulating for three, four years, that's a sensible start. What's our way out of the deep capture of the politicians by big money? Boy, I, that's a tough, when you call, when you figure that one out, call collect, I'm so discouraged with the political class. You know, there's an economist you've probably heard of, Simon Johnson. Guy was That's TV, right. And he's, I'm totally in his camp, and a guy named William Black, who used to be at the FDIC. And they, you know, Simon Johnson says, look, this is no different than what we used to see at the IMF when we'd go into Indonesia, you've got a political class that leveraged the, the company. I mean, I'm sorry, you've got an oligarchy who, le who owns the political class. They leverage the, the place until it melts down, and then they're looking for a bailout. So it's a boom and bailout cycle. 
and it really comes down to do you get leadership who's willing to stand up to the oligarchs? Well, I think that we don't have much evidence. I don't think that we're, you know, I think we would we would have been better off to let all of Wall Street melt down. That would have sort of solved this republic's problems all at once. And, you know, I don't think it would have affected people, Americans in their homes nearly as much as it would have affected a bunch of, you know. It's, so uh, I wonder if there's any solution. You know, the argument's going to be that we're going to drift along for 10 or 15 years like the Japanese did when they when they propped up their zombie banks. They drifted for 10 or 15 years. And that we're, the same thing's going to happen to us until we stand up to this problem that is taking over culture, and that is we've got the oligarchs and the banks who control Wall Street, and we're just or control D.C. And as long as we keep bailing them out, we'll never really have anything but a bottom bouncing recovery. This that this recovery is not going to turn out turn right. out much. Right. And Simon Johnson also said we uh, we look a lot like the Russians did uh, when their oligarchs captured their government. Right. And then the first thing you do uh, when uh, you run into trouble is the oligarchs pay off I'm sorry the politicians pay off the oligarchs that's exactly what we did here in the US with I this, agree. With I this totally bailout agree. and Bill Black's been on this show and he, he has a great book best way to rob a bank is to own a bank <laughs> right. it's, an inside, it's an inside job <laughs> the whole thing's an inside job this is, this is rich bankers bailing out rich bankers on your credit card alright Patrick Byrne CEO of Overstock and DeepCapture.com as well thanks so much for joining us on the Young Turks thank you very much it's a pleasure